Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Welcome to RPV City Talk, and we're ready to talk with the great mayor pro tem of Rancho Palos Verdes, John Cruikshank. Oh, what a title. Yeah. We are here at the Trump National Golf Club where you just conducted the monthly mayor's breakfast with our local uh, commission and committee chairs. This happens every month right here. It's always great to be right here too, right? No, Trump National is beautiful. Of course, we're, you know, you and I are looking out at the ocean right now. And, you know, the one thing that why we love our city is the views and of course the ocean. Right. We also love all of our committee and commission chairs that volunteer their time and that's exactly what you did. Yes. Before we get into this, the, there's a lot of big issues in our city specifically. We're going to be talking about the landslide issues, but um, and you, just any takeaways from today's breakfast you just had with, with, our, with our representatives? No, and, and I think it's, it's nice to share this with people that we do have a monthly mayor's breakfast. And of course, we either we alternate between some of the restaurants here on in Rancho Palos Verdes. And this is a great way for us as elected officials to hear from the committee chairs and our planning commission chair in regards to the work they're doing, because it's their groups that are really uh, have their ears to the ground in regards to real uh, issues that they've been tackling. The things that I hear and learn from them every time really help me do my job as a city council member, because I much better understand you know, some of the nuances, the finance committee, the infrastructure committee, all the nitty gritty things that they get into and hear from our residents, our traffic committee. And these are things that are really important to our residents. And so for me, I, I love this meeting because I always leave this meeting learning so much and, and understanding a lot more. So it helps me do my job. I think you see one of the takeaways is as an elected leader, you're always trying to do a better job listening to what the residents are asking for because the decisions you're making on the council impacts what's happening to the residents. One of the takeaways to me, and I always talk about this to people, is that you know we do things that affect people's lives. And so if we're gonna do that sort of thing, we wanna hear from the people that it's going to affect. And I think all politicians, regardless of what level of government they're in, should always want to make sure that they understand who it's going to affect before they take any type of action. And one of the big biggest actions the city council has just recently take, had to take was declaring a local state of emergency within the Portuguese Bend landslide complex um, due to the recent movement and the havoc it's creating um, for local property owners. Um, and it's all about safety right now with, with what's going on, broken water pipes and, and all, everything and, and some homes having to be red tagged. So you, as a council just declared this local emergency in an interim building moratorium. So explain what's going on, the decision that you had decided to make, why you did it and where we're going right now. So the state of emergency uh, gives our city uh, the ability to do things uh, such as asking for people to limit or shut off their irrigation that actually adds to the water table. And as you mentioned, what, what's happened is, is over the last several months, we've had, you know, our last rainy season was more rain, double, triple what we're used to uh, seeing. And so what's happened is the water table, which if you look at the you know, geography of the hill, the water table has been rising and because of the amount of water and it used to be 80, 90 feet below the surface and now it's only about eight or nine feet. So as that water gets into our into the soil, it makes it saturated and heavier and it also, the bentonite where the land actually slips, that's wet and so that's why you have the land movement that's occurring and so because of the land movement, now you have the utility lines such as the water lines and, and other utilities, sewer and gas, that get affected by that. So it affects all of us right now and that's why we had to declare a state of emergency that, to give our city the tools and the resources to be able to ask for financial assistance from the county and the state and the federal government. So of course you have to weigh out the pros and cons. What does this mean? Because it might sign on this alarm and you think, wow, we are in a yes. state of an emergency in Rancho Palos Verdes within the complex area. Um, so, it, and, and you did that as a council. Well, right, I mean, so our first city council meeting where we, it was first brought forward by council member Alegria in regards to uh, declaring a state of emergency. Uh, we, we asked questions of our city manager and our city attorney in regards to what would the implications be because as you mentioned, you don't want to create a panic necessarily. Um, and of course, when people think of the peninsula and they don't live here, 
they, they might say, wow, the whole entire, and I get questions all the time, like, is everyone in jeopardy in regards to landslides? But, you know, if you kind of put the whole problem in context, there's roughly 15, 16,000 residential structures in Rancho Palos Verdes. We've unfortunately had two homes red tagged. So to declare a state of emergency doesn't mean the entire city, it's just the landslide complex. Uh, well, there are three, there's the Abalone Cove, there's the Portuguese Bend and the Klondike Canyon, um, but they're all one complex there, and so that's where the state of emergency has been declared. Well, I think over the years, as we know, Portuguese Bend landslide has, is known as, um, unfortunately for us, the most active landslide yes. in all of North America, um, and it's been wreaking havoc for like 70 years now since it first kicked in when there was construction on Crenshaw Boulevard to do a little history lesson for people to understand even the sort of the background of that landslide. And when you say there are three areas, it is divided. So you have Portuguese Bend, Abalone Cove, and then you have Klondike Canyon, right? right. So when you see a map, it's like 240 acres, I think, or something like Large that. Area. And of course, our preserve sits in the middle of it. Right. And um, that's, we're gonna be talking about that, the imp impact it's having right now on the trail system, right. because trails have had to, 60 well, We've had to close some of the trails, certainly. And we've been told by uh, city geologists that that's an important thing to do because you know, not just for the safety issue, because there are fissures that open up and we've had it where they're 10, 20 foot deep and they're a real safety hazard. And not only that, but you also, uh, if you have maintenance vehicles and heavy emergency vehicles, that actually helps the movement, uh, create more movement right. within the landslide. So we don't want any of that. You mentioned about the homes that were red tagged. They, have, they happen to be in my neighborhood where I live, Seaview, just across from Trump here. Um, and that was because they became uninhabitable. Of course, our hearts go out to other residents um, that are living right now in my neighborhood in that, in that Klondike Canyon abatement district area because they're all just living, waiting, and wondering you know, how what's going on with this movement. And it's good that we're talking about it at the first of this show because this what's going on in your area and the whole landslide complex area is the number one priority for our city. So I just want people to know that. There have been two homes in your community that have been red tagged. And what that essentially means is that they're basically unsafe for people to be inhabiting those homes. So we've actually asked uh, people that live in those homes to vacate those homes mm -hmm. for their own safety. And what you see there is you see the homes being separated from the foundation and major movement within the homes. And so these are our structural issues and we certainly don't want anyone to get hurt uh, there in their homes. That's a very serious issue though because now you're asking someone to move out of their home. And the value of the home obviously is affected. And we all know in just getting insurance for your home is difficult anyhow. And I don't believe anyone really has a landslide insurance. So that, that's another issue too. So now you start to see that this becomes and other things to monitor now. Also, they've been developing a plan to uh, the pipes that are 50, 60 years old, the water pipes, to have them all put above ground in the Seaview area. So that plan, I believe, has been completed and it's in the process of just being reviewed and finalized. So that could be good news, because then when there's a water break, then you could clearly see it and fix it instead of just letting it, just water going I in. Know. And then, of course, our county friends, they and their uh, sewer lines, the, the pressure lines that run through Portuguese Bend, I know they're out there every day inspecting those lines as well and making sure that's good, because obviously a major break to one of those lines would be, could be catastrophic. Right. So You've got aging infrastructure, moving land, it's not the best scenario, but uh, I think that I know residents have been coming to council saying it's frustrating, like, you know, that we report these leaks, there's, you know, thousands of gallons of water going into the preserve right now, and then you don't have the utility addressing it for hours. But I think everyone's obviously trying to do the best they can. Yeah, at this no, point. I, I believe that. And, you know, our utility partners have uh, stepped up at this point yes. and, and are addressing these issues. So we're thankful for that. And I talked about Seaview, but also that, that there's 35 homes in what's called the Klondike Canyon Abatement District, and they go down right into the Portuguese Bend Beach Club area as well. So there's everyone sort of on high alert right now. Um, you just drive around and you can see the road. We all know as a community, the bumpy road, which is the city is spending, what, about a million dollars more At a year? At least a million. Dealing with that. And the city overall, the big long-term solution that we could put out there, um, I don't think you can actually stop a slide, but what, you know. No, I, <laughs> you, no, no, I don't think fine. you can actually stop. Well, with the current technology we have, no, you cannot. 
you can certainly reduce the rate in which it moves, mm -hmm. and that's what the goal is. Um, and, and just to put it in context, uh, so the three landslide areas, the Abalone Cove landslide area, which is uh, north of the bigger Portuguese Bend complex, uh, they've installed and maintained wells, and they, they did have movements every year of a foot or two, I believe, and they've reduced that down to you know inches. The work that they've done in terms of maintenance and putting in wells and that has actually reduced it. They, the issue with the Portuguese Bend landslide, and the reason there's three different, they're different types of landslides. In the Portuguese Bend, it's a complex landslide, what you mentioned, and it's because it's not just one big mass moving as one big mass, it's several different masses within and they're all moving in different directions. So what's occurred is, is that you can't just use the traditional vertical wells because those get sheared off. And so many things have been tried over the decades since the 50s, as you mentioned, when it first uh, started. And those have all essentially failed. And what we believe we can do is there's three actions. Uh, minimize the amount of water that gets into the uh, actual uh, ground by having storm drain systems that capture and, and remove it before it gets in, closing the fissures that we talked about, and then finally hydroaugers that would be underneath the bentonite layer so that that water table as it tries to make its way up into that uh, would actually be drawn down by hydroaugers, the same uh, technology that they use for uh, horizontal oil fracking type operations. Mm -hmm. We have this community has been well aware of the draft EIR that went out with the landslide and remediation project. So the city is you know been working on this is issue continuously oh, the council yes. um how do you feel like your council this particular council because every council has been dealing with it is taking really just moving this forward are you feeling that way that no i definitely think that you know, once again this is the number one priority for for us in this in this city just because of all the safety implications and so i think our council has done a very good job of of moving things and listening to people and getting the right people involved with coming up with solutions and you know if there was just one answer to it we would just do that one right. answer but there isn't just one answer and and of course going back to the EIR which is um, you know an environmental impact report that that's a process that takes a long time where you get public input and and we already had the project for the Portuguese Bend prior well before all this activity has occurred in fact it started this process started well before I was even on the City Council mm -hmm. And of course, this year now you can see what happens when the water table rises and uh, now all three of the uh, landslide areas have been activated to a point where we're here today. My colleagues certainly believe in, in finding solutions. We've talked to both our state uh, representatives who uh, can help us because it's a state document uh, in terms of keeping the process moving with the EIR to look for solutions. And of course, as a state of emergency, if there's things we can do now um, to reduce the rate of uh, movement and to protect our homeowners, we're gonna take those actions as well. We wrap up to move on to other topics regarding the landslide issue and what's going on there. Anything else that you wanna share as far as, again, that we had, you declared the local um, emergency for now, and I don't know how long that will remain in, yeah, in effect. Um, but do you already feel like there's been a benefit by taking that step? I definitely do. I think it gives our city the tools to be able to help our residents. And I know that it, it could be a frightening time for people, you and your neighbors, and I understand that. We want to make sure that our city has the resources as well. So by declaring a state of emergency, we can now go to the state and federal government and ask for resources right. from them. It is about resources. And of course, our city received, was it 28 million? Uh, it was 23 million. 23. I'm adding uh, another five, I know at least that's a nice. Yeah, no, but it's yeah. a, certainly, uh, it was a BRIC grant, um, which is through a FEMA, right. uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And uh, we were very fortunate to get that uh, a grant. Uh, that was for the Portuguese Bend area. Of course, we're going to be using every penny of that, and we also need to get matching funds. And so we've been reaching out to the county officials and the state officials for a few years now, right. uh, and we believe they're going to help us. Well, certainly protecting that, that area, just the road itself, but along PV Drive South, um, that's a major corridor. So it's, not, it's beyond just being, like you're saying, a local issue. It's, it's not just a Rancho Palos Verdes issue. It's a regional issue. Mm -hmm. uh, people from the San Pedro area are traveling uh, right. along the coast. And anyone that drives on Palos Verdes Drive South knows there's quite a bit of traffic there. Yeah. We, re we re did mention the trail system. We've, you know, we have, you know, our, we've become an area where people come from all over to come hike in our trails. 
um, but it's everything's posted, go on the website about that, because at this point, it's 60% of the trail system has been temporarily closed for safety. Right, that's And that's, right. we don't know when there, that. There's still trails in our city that are yes, open, so yes. if you come to our city, you can certainly enjoy those. But like you said, when you get here, you might see some signs of trails closed. So, you know, don't, uh, please be patient with our city because mm -hmm. we're dealing with something very serious. All right, and this is very serious. So anything I didn't reference that you want to make sure residents understand about this ongoing situation? We want to continue to work with our state partners because they're going to be critical in terms of moving forward. And we've, we've had them out here and we've called them and the next day they've been out here. So I want to say thank you to both our, our Senator Allen and to Assemblymember Marasucci. They've, they've both taken this very seriously and they've been out here and they're here to help us. All right, well, thanks for all you're doing. I know this is something that the city is continuously looking into and addressing. So on that note, as the city's tackling the landslide, you're also moving forward with plans to possibly uh, potentially redevelop the Kendida Civic Center. We might see a new city hallway one day down the road. Um, and uh, the council community has been addressing this together with the Civic Center Advisory Committee. So why don't you just give us an update on what's happening as maybe now the council has decided it's time to go into phase two of looking into this. Well, as many in our community might realize, we, we created a Civic Center Advisory Committee many years ago. In fact, before I was even on the city council, at that point their charge was to develop a master plan. And concurrently with that, we, we had the Ladera Linda Community Center, which was being developed. and and it's going to be opening, yes. we believe, fairly soon, and, and which is super exciting. And that's actually a fairly major project as well because a community center, as, as we know, you know, has the buildings and the parks and that. So we learned a lot from Ladera Linda and the whole process there in terms of getting community input and, and understanding the impacts and implications. And so the Civic Center Advisory Committee have been working for years. They've been working over the last few years with uh, Gensler Architecture Company and uh, developing those master plans and they've gone through several gyrations and then there's also been a lot of issues because it is federal property in terms of what can and can't be done on the property and so um, that's all been cleaned up as well. I have to thank our Civic Center Advisory Committee and on top of that our Finance Advisory Committee because the two of them have been working over the last several months very diligently to not only look at what can be done, but how can we pay for it and what can we currently afford? Because I think these are questions that weren't always asked for the Ladera project. So a lot of lessons learned prior to this. And so uh, at the October 17th meeting, uh, the city council unanimously voted to move forward with phase two, which means we're gonna look, look at a design competition in regards to what really can be done and start putting pencil to paper, and I guess in today's world, CAD, right. of course. Uh, but start developing plans uh, to what, what can be done and, and putting budgets to that. And, but we'll, we'll be looking at choosing a few teams to maybe move forward and give mm -hmm. us some great ideas. And to give the community perspective on the need to, to at least build a new city hall, for example, our current staff and administrations working in, you know, World War II, uh, Nike missile site operation there where you have right. like, you know, you hear about, oh, they don't have heating or, I mean, it's time for a city of our caliber to kind of upgrade. And and on that note, may I think the council may even be considering upgrading options right until long-term planning. You talked about that yeah, I mean, the last council. It, well, and, and it was great to have uh, former mayor and councilman Ken Dida there in right. person to uh, tell us his ideas and you know the current building which you mentioned was World War II vintage mm -hmm. um, it's it was barracks I believe some of the rooms there are shower heads and yes. the, the drains are actually covered up by tiles and drywall um, you could peel those back and see the old walls and barracks uh, there so no those buildings were not meant to be a civic center or civic mm -hmm. city hall those were meant to be barracks and so we were fortunate enough to get the amazing piece of property and have those buildings to use for 50 years. Um, but it's time. To me, there's two real reasons to have a new civic center. Number one, the residents. You know, residents love being there for 4th of July and all the different yeah. events. Plus, it's where we go to do our business, our city business. And second, we've got uh, our staff. We don't have a huge staff. You know, we have 70, 80 people that work for our city. We're a contract city. But these people are managers and leaders, and so you need to be able to recruit and have them working in a place that, that's comfortable for right. them and, and meets current codes and safety codes and all that. And so th those are the two main reasons. Of course, we also want to bring our city council eventually 
to City Hall versus being in a separate location a mile away, which we currently have. So there's a lot of different reasons why. Well, I know this is still going to be a long term and a, a planning process. And again, thanks to the Civic Center Advisory uh, Committee and the Finance Committee, because I think one thing that came out of that was just like just general figures. I think there's been times when you've heard like this could be a hundred million dollar project. But I think realistically, um, they were talking about like what the city could afford, which was less than $50 million. Right. Right. And just so the numbers are out there, I mean, the, the Civic Center all-in plan was about $105, $110 million. Right. So, and that number's already been out there. And I think that's another lesson learned. Let's just get the number out there. And then our finance committee looked at what can we really afford given our current guidelines in terms of budgeting. Right. It's about 45. So there's obviously a gap. But there's a lot of mechanisms to make up the gap. Mm -hmm. The current project that's been identified is probably about 70, 80 million. And with a design competition and some you know, thinkers out there that come up with good ideas, we're going to find a way to make it happen. We already have, we use it so much for the community, like you said, 4th of July. Um, we just, I was just there for the Halloween harvest, um, what's called the Halloween trunk or treat. Trunk or treat. Um, we were just there with all, it, it was a wonderful, wonderfully attended event and, and that's just where we all come together as a community. Speaking of coming together as a community, the, uh, the ninth annual Prepared Peninsula Expo just took place at Peninsula High School, put on by all four cities, um, as a way to discuss emergency preparedness and planning. Um, and you were there, and uh, following this year's expo, there was a, um, also town a town hall you, that you participated in. So um, just an overview of how vitally important the town hall, the expo is to helping us prepare for whatever disaster might strike. Every individual family needs to take the preparations necessary to keep their family safe. And we do have an emergency preparedness committee in our city, and they've been around for many years. And, and their whole goal is to you know, find the proper ways to keep our residents uh, informed of, of emergency preparedness and, and what to do. And so this particular expo that was put on by Assemblymember Marasucci uh, had a number of vendors there. And it's uh, critically important to have our vendors participate. And the reason it's important is it's not just landslides. We've got our fires. Uh, we've got you know potential rain issues that could cause problems. I don't know if I've ever heard of a mudslide, but I you know we should be prepared for anything. And you know right now because there's only really one main road that goes around our peninsula, which is Palos Verdes Drive. Um, we need to know how to best evacuate uh, our, our areas if there is that, or if it's sometimes, like they say, the best evacuation is to not evacuate, stay in your homes, to not clog up the roads. It's actually safer just to stay in your home. So that's why it's important for people to uh, be prepared. I remember hearing a, a first responder once saying, getting ready for an emergency or preparing while the emergency happening isn't being prepared. So I think we all have a tendency, you know, you just hear the constant, like, have your kit ready, have a gallon of water per person in your home for at least two weeks, because if we're cut off. And so personally, what do you do at your house? I'm just curious to get oh, ready. No, we, so we do have all the water and we change that out. We have a number of uh, uh, different kits. We make sure the batteries and the flashlights are there. And, but on top of just what we do personally in, in our house, what we've also done is we make sure that we know all of our neighbors, you know, who they are and what their limitations are. Of course, where the seniors live. And uh, we're, of course, prepared to go check on them as well. If, and mm -hmm. I, I, I recommend that to anyone in any community, uh, any neighborhood in our city, that get to know your neighbors. I, I feel like that's the best thing we can really do is right. that know who they are and know who to potentially help if they need it. Right. And when a disaster strikes, it doesn't know boundaries. That's why, as, as a peninsula, all four cities work together, like hosting that expo and also putting together the new website, pvpready.gov. Um, that's where you, we're really encouraging residents, and they did that at the expo, because I was there walking around, and we have a show on our PVTV all about it. Nice. Um, and the basic thing is that by going on pvpready.gov, you sign up for what's called Know Your Zone, right? So yes. we get to know more about that, how we will deal with, if there is an emergency, what do you do if it's affecting your neighborhood? And I think it's a great site, and then the council, everybody supported putting that together. Well, we did. It's a great site. And I do recommend everyone go on this site because I went onto the site and I found that our community is actually in a zone that's also with people below us. So that, that evacuation route wouldn't necessarily work. We should be in a different, slightly different zone. Okay. So we've sent that information Excellent. to the people that do those sites and they're fixing right. that. So I do recommend that everyone go on there to make sure that they understand 
what zone they're in and if it makes sense yeah. for their community to be a part of that zone because remember those were put together just by a, a small handful of people and they need our input. Well, we can't give out our city website enough, rpvca.gov, for all of this that you can navigate around. Our city's actually updated the website too. It looks fantastic. It does look fantastic. Um, so, well, that was good. And I know the town hall, you got up and spoke about with everything that's going on, right? The community was coming together for more answers, whether about the landslide going on, fires, insurance, a whole myriad of issues everyone's concerned about. It's a whole myriad of issues. And, and you know, we can't stress enough emergency preparedness and, and, and we don't know when it's gonna strike or, or what it's gonna be, but every, every year there's something new that we're, we're dealing with. Right. And so people need to be prepared. Also, we can text alerts. That, there's that alert, South Bay Alerts mm -hmm. is another um, website to go on to that you can get put on your phone to find out what's going on in the whole South Bay. That's right. So I want to mention that. Um, the town hall you spoke at was sponsored, put together by uh, State Assembly member Almer Tsuchi's office. Yes. So I want to segue to what's going on in the state because mm. our city has become really proactive in monitoring bills and legislation um, that it specifically impacts our city. And that came up at your last council meeting on October 17th. You got a legislative update. Um, so any takeaways you want to share from that? Um, from like, you know, bills, there was nine bills, I believe, that this council wrote letters about. Um, and you got, a, you got an update about what, ha what was the status of all that legislation. Right, well, we, we do have a, a, a consultant in Sacramento that uh, is a lobbyist for us. And their, their office does track bills and things that are gonna affect us. And um, I'm sure people realize the numerous num uh, bills that come out of Sacramento every year. I think they, this year they started out with 2,800 bills and pared it down to obviously much less than that, fortunately. Yeah, there were some bills that we supported that, that were passed. Um, there was this AB 584, mm -hmm. which actually gives uh, emergency waivers for reconstruction repair of structures uh, during an event. Um, also, one that I personally signed on to was SB 244, which is the right to repair. Um, in other words, you have something that needs to be repaired and instead of having being forced to go back to the original manufacturer it allows mom and pop repair shops to be able to repair those and, mm -hmm. and they they have the ability to now get the parts and tools and and manuals to be able to help us so that that should be able to keep the cost down of repair so those are good things um, a few things that actually we uh, opposed not that we have a lot of sidewalks but ab 825 allows electric bikes to be ridden on the sidewalk. Uh, that's not something we supported at all. And, and unfortunately- but that got was, signed by the it, governor. It did get signed. And of course, there's a number of housing bills and I, those are too numerous to go through at this point. But our planning commissioners are doing a great job of tracking that as long, and our, our legislative consultant. Um, but the, the housing bills are something that are near and dear to everyone on the Hill, and we've been right. tracking those. I know, and we have a, it's called the Legislation Corner on yep. our website, that you can really see what's going on because the bills that you're currently watching as a council, all in the end, it's about making sure what's happening there is not affecting our local control as well, right? I mean, that's- 100%, <laughs> and without pushing back or, or showing support to our state legislators, they, they wouldn't listen to us. And we know that our letters and our calls and, and that they do listen to us and we do have an effect uh, in terms of the activity that they take. We're going to move on to leadership that by the council regarding one neighborhood in RPV Grandview Estates. Um, we've been hearing for at least the, for past months about power outage problems that they've been dealing with to the point where I think there were neighbors without power for days and it, you can't have that, especially with seniors. Right. But you've been on it working with SoCal Edison to address solutions. They have come before the council from time to time with updates. You're gonna see them again in November, I believe. Yes. Um, but overall, what's your message for the Grandview Estates residents and overall people that feel that they're not being heard by their utilities? So we all know that uh, our utilities are monopolies and mm -hmm. we're stuck with the ones that we have. So they don't have competition. Uh, so they, they, they shouldn't take, ever take that for granted that they have that. As someone that has to compete against other engineering companies, I understand when you, don't have competition, it gets easy to be complacent. And, and I think in the Grandview area, uh, unfortunately, those residents were 
were dealing with things they should not have been dealing with. And so Councilman Sayo rightly brought this issue to us and, and uh, has asked Edison to address it. I believe that things have been stabilized a bit, although there's still issues and we still are asking him to come to right. the council. Well, again, thanks for all you're doing. And uh, we always appreciate being right here. Thank you to the Trump National Golf Club staff for letting us come here and, and host our show. And uh, we wish you all the best out there. Stay safe and stay connected, RPV. See you next time.